Hallelujah and blessings, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a lifestyle, and Jesus Christ is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together our hearts sing, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study on the road to Calvary, book two, We Would See Jesus. This will be part three in this book, and today's section is titled, Seeing Jesus as All We Need. One of the most breathtaking occasions when Jesus claimed equality with the Father was when he said, Before Abraham was, I am. You'll find this in John chapter 8, verse 58. The sentence immediately challenges our attention because of the extraordinary liberty it takes with our grammar. If the Lord Jesus had merely wanted to express his pre existence, he would surely have said, Before Abraham was, I was. But he says, before Abraham was, I am. Without any doubt, he has taken us back to that day when Moses, bowing before God at the burning bush, asked what name he should give the God who was sending him to the children of Israel. God's reply then was, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you, Jehovah, God of your fathers has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Thereafter, God's personal name became Jehovah, which comes from the same Hebrew root as I am, and it means the same. Thus it was when the Lord Jesus said this word to the Jews, he dared to claim to be the great I am of the Old Testament, whom they all knew to be the covenant God of their fathers. He went farther, saying that for them, their own eternal destiny would depend on their accepting him as such. For he said, if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. John chapter 8 verse 24. The meaning of this great name, Jehovah, that is, I am, which Jesus claimed for himself, is twofold. It means, first of all, that he is the ever-present one, who stands outside of time, to whom there is no past nor future, but to whom everything is present. Clearly, that is the first meaning of this strange mixture of tenses. Before Abraham was, I am. And that surely is what eternity is, not merely elongated time running horizontally from left to right with a past, present, and future, but another realm altogether where everything is one glorious present. It is for this reason that the French Bible always translates the name Jehovah as El Eternal, the Eternal One. The relation of the eternal one to us in time can be illustrated by the relation of a reader to the events in a book. In the story, in the book, there is a sequence of time. As the pages are turned, certain incidents go into the past. Others come into the present, and yet others remain in the future. And yet the reader himself is in another realm altogether. He can open the book at any page. And to him, the incidents are all present, actually happening in that moment as he reads them. What a vision this gives us of our Lord Jesus, the Eternal One, the I Am. To him, our lives with their past and future are all present. Our yesterdays, as well as our tomorrows, are all now to him. More important for us, however, is the fact that this name Jehovah is used almost uniformly in connection with that earthly people to whom he brought himself into covenant obligations, the children of Israel. To the Gentile nations, he was just God. But to his chosen people, to whom he had pledged special promises, he was ever Jehovah. 
The fact that this name was intended to have a special significance to them is made clear when God says to Moses, I am Jehovah, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Exodus chapter 6 verse 2 and 3. Quite obviously then, this name is meant to convey to them a new and precious revelation. But what is it? The special revelation which this name gives is that of the grace of God. I am is an unfinished sentence. It has no object. I am what? What is our wonder when we discover, as we continue with our Bibles, that he is saying, I am whatever my people need, and that the sentence is only left blank that man may bring his many and various needs as they arise to complete it. Apart from human need, this great name of God goes round and round in a closed circle. I am that I am, which means that God is incomprehensible. But the moment human need and misery present themselves, he becomes just what that person needs. The verb has at least an object. The sentence is complete and God is revealed and known. Do we lack peace? I am thy peace, he says. Do we lack strength? I am thy strength. Do we lack spiritual life? I am thy life. Do we lack wisdom? I am thy wisdom. And so on. The name Jehovah is really like a blank check. Your faith can fill in what he is to be to you, just what you need as each need arises. It is not you, moreover, who are beseeching him for this privilege, but he who is pressing it upon you. He is asking you to ask. He says in John 16, 24, Hitherto, have you asked nothing in my name? Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Just as water is ever seeking the lowest depths in order to fill them, so is Jehovah ever seeking out man's need in order to satisfy it. Where there is need, there is God. Where there is sorrow, misery, unhappiness, suffering, confusion, folly, oppression, there is the I am, yearning to turn man's sorrow into bliss whenever men will let him. It is not, therefore, the hungry seeking for bread, but the bread seeking for the hungry. Not the sad seeking for joy, but rather joy seeking the sad. Not emptiness seeking fullness, but rather fullness seeking emptiness. And it is not merely that he supplies our need, but he becomes himself the fulfillment of our need. He is ever, I am, that which my people need. Oh, the grace of it, the surprise of it. Why should he? What claim have we on him for this? Even man before the fall had no claim on this God for this much less man who has rebelled and fallen, and most of whose needs and miseries are but the result of his own sin. But that is grace, and that is God. Grace, being what it is, is always drawn by need. And this is no extra nor afterthought on the part of God. It is his way of revealing himself. Apart from our need, he is, I am, that I am. But as he is allowed to become the fulfillment of our need, he is seen for what he really is. That is why a mere academic understanding of the things of God is never the way to see him and to know him. It is as we come to him with our needs that then he says, Thou shalt know that I am thee, Jehovah. Sometimes in the Old Testament, this blank check, the name Jehovah, is filled in for us, to encourage us to fill it in ourselves as we have need. Every now and then we come across Jehovah compounded with another word to form his completed name for that occasion. In one place, the children of Israel had need of a banner to rally their drooping spirits 
and to lead them into victory against the forces that lay against them as they journeyed through the wilderness. They found their Jehovah God to be just that to them. And so, after the victory over Amalek, they built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, which means, I am thy banner. You'll find this story in Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. You see, it was his warfare, not merely theirs. In another place, Gideon feared for his life, for he had seen an angel of Jehovah face to face. Then Jehovah said to him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Thus it was discovered that Jehovah was peace, even to a sinner like Gideon. And to commemorate the new revelation, he built an altar unto Jehovah and called it Jehovah Shalom, meaning, I am thy peace. This story can be found in Judges chapter 6, verse 24. In yet another place, Jeremiah says of the Messiah who was to come, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called, Jehovah Siskanu. That is, I am thy righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. Israel shall be saved and dwell safely because Jehovah will stand for them answering every accusation against them, becoming their surety and their righteousness. So it goes on. Seven such wonderful compounds of Jehovah. Seven places in the Old Testament where the check, I am, is filled up for us for our encouragement. What a study these compound names are. That, however, is outside the scope of this little book. For our aim is to fix our attention on the supreme compound of Jehovah, which is Jesus. This might be written J-E-S-U-S, and it seems it is but a contraction of Jehovah Sus, or J-E-H-O-V-A-H-S-U-S, which simply means, I am thy salvation. Sooner or later, if Jehovah means, I am what you need, he will have to undertake our basic need as sinners. As such, we are justly condemned by his holy law, and we languish in the misery and famine of the far country of our own choosing. All the other needs which the other compound names of Jehovah reveal him as meeting are not especially the needs of his people as sinners. But in Jesus, Jehovah undertakes to be what his people need most as sinners, without excuse and without rights. God could have undertaken his people's other needs without sending Jesus. He did so in the Old Testament, and he could have continued to do so in our time. But when it came to his people's needs as sinners, it had to be Jesus. There was no other way. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin, and God did not withhold him. He so loved us that he sent him, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person to effect by the shedding of his blood a full redemption from sin for us, and as a risen Savior to be continually all his people need as sinners. For our need as sinners is continuous right up to the gates of heaven. We can now say not only where there is need, there is God, but where there is sin, there is Jesus, and that is something far more wonderful. There is not always something blameworthy in a need, and we can understand God being touched and drawn by humanity's need, but humanity's sin, surely that does not draw him, except in judgment, but no, just because God is what he is, and Jesus is what he is, and grace is what it is, it is gloriously true. Where there is sin, there is always Jesus, seeking to forgive sin and recover all the damage that it has caused. He is not shocked at human failure. Rather, he is at home in it, drawn by it, knowing what to do about it, for he himself 
and in his blood is the answer to it all. So it is, whenever we think of Jesus, we must think of someone whose coming was necessitated only by the offensive business of our sin. He is firstly and lastly the answer to sin. But God, in giving him to be the answer to our sin, has given him to be the answer to all our other needs, both spiritual, moral, and material. For how shall he not with him also freely give us all things, we are told in Romans chapter 8. Jesus thus takes into himself all the meaning of the Old Testament compound names of Jehovah, fulfilling and eclipsing them all in the final compound name he became, Jesus, I am thy salvation. All this implies that we must see ourselves as sinners. Believers, though we may be of many years standing, and that we must do so, not in a merely theoretical way, but under the searching and specific conviction of the Holy Spirit. In the pages that follow in this book, we will come back to that again and again. For apart from seeing ourselves as sinners, we shall see no beauty in Jesus that we should desire him. He has no meaning except as the answer to sin. To see thyself a sinner is the beginning of salvation, said St. Augustine, and we may add to continue to see ourselves as sinners is the continuance of salvation. An African who had been convicted of sin after being a professing Christian for years testified, I never saw Jesus till I saw him through my sins. We would see Jesus is our theme in this book. Seeing him is not merely attaining an objective knowledge of him. It is something subjective and experimental. It is seeing him by faith to be just what I need as a sinner, a failure, a poverty-stricken weakling, and allowing him to be just that to me in this hour. And it is not selfish to seek to see him thus. It is in his being what I need as a sinner that he is revealed and known. Jesus Christ is made to me all I need, all I need. He alone is all my plea. He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power. Holiness, this very hour. My redemption, full and sure. He is all I need. That brings us to the end of our study today, friends. And I would like to end by going back and reading something we heard earlier in our study. And I would encourage you just to stop and focus and allow these words to resonate in your soul. It is not the hungry seeking for bread, but the bread seeking the hungry. It is not the sad seeking for joy, but rather joy seeking the sad. It is not emptiness seeking fullness, but rather fullness seeking emptiness. And it is not merely he that supplies our need, but he becomes himself the fulfillment of our need. For he is ever, I am that which my people need. May the Lord Jesus be glorified in all that we do, all that we say, all that we think. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I'll see you on the next video.